Hi, everyone. Welcome. Hope you all are doing well. If any of you are calling in from Texas, I hope you're staying warm. That's where I am currently. Um, welcome to the first information webinar for the Ready to Learn Podcast Accelerator from PRX, PBS, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. My name is Stephanie Kuo, and I'm the Senior Manager of Training at PRX. I've been involved with and have managed several of our past accelerators here, like the Project Catapult for public media stations and the Google Podcast Creator Program for international audio makers. So we are so excited to be expanding into children's podcasting with this training program specifically. Oh, Carrie, you unmute yourself. <laughs> I moved my uh, screen over so I could see your face, Stephanie. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Carrie Hoffman. I'm the CEO of uh, PRX. And I'm so excited to start this uh, webinar with Stephanie because we've had a lot of interest in looking for some non-screen alternatives for kids. And so this is a nice way to think about how to make that content and learn how to shape your idea and we're really excited about the opportunity to work with PBS as well. Um, and Stephanie, I'll just like let everybody know that we'll also be answering some questions that you may have uh, at the end. Right. There will be plenty of time for questions towards the end of this webinar, but you will see in your Zoom bar a Q&A function, so feel free to send questions as they come to mind there. Um, another member of our team who is off screen will be kind of flagging those questions for us to answer out loud, or we'll be sending you relevant links or answering your questions via text. Um, also, this webinar will be recorded and uploaded to the Ready to Learn website. Um, by next week. So if you missed it um, and want to refer to it or send it to others, um, you can go there as well. And there will be a second webinar in March that will go over the same things and possibly some new questions that come up. Uh, but first, everything honestly that you'll need to know about this program and the application process is at this website, prx.org slash ready dash to dash learn. Um, at that website, you will find a very detailed uh, FAQ, um, a link to the actual application on submittable and info about the ready to learn initiative itself. Um, if we are receiving um, a lot of new questions that are becoming more and more common or more frequent, we will be updating that FAQ and we will be addressing it in the following webinar as well. Next slide, Eric, please. Um, but of course, an important uh, day and time to remember is that the application deadline for this accelerator is March 19th at 5 p.m. Eastern. So put this in your calendar, put it on a piece of poster board or a post-it note and just put it somewhere so you don't miss it. This is a deadline for the application. We'll be reminding you about it several times. If you're on any of our mailing lists, it'll be promoted on social media. So we hope you don't forget it. Um, but we don't want to miss out on some great ideas. So please mark March 19th, 5 p.m. Eastern on your calendars. Next slide, please, Eric. We're gonna, I'm gonna pass this section over to Carrie. Yeah, so as I expressed my excitement earlier, um, many of you may be familiar with the uh, Ready to Learn program, but if you're not, it's an initiative that is uh, offered by uh, uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, CPB, and PBS with support from the Department of Education. And the aim is to really develop new content that helps young children in, uh, particularly those in low income homes, build vital skills that help them succeed in life and in school. And this, and each, each one of these programs has a theme, but most importantly, we're looking to improve kind of functional literacy, critical thinking, interpersonal collaboration, and really kind of age appropriate exposure to career development. The career development and multi generational learning is the theme for this season, I guess you could call it, of Ready to Learn. And so our role in this is really to uh, open up the opportunity in audio. And, um, and so this, this is one of the things that 
is growing as podcasting becomes more popular, so does uh, podcasting available to, uh, for this age group. So we're going to work with PBS and CPB to uh, create a 16-week virtual podcast training program. Um, we're going to select five production teams to work with. And the training will um, really focus on a listener-centered approach. That's how we run all of our training programs. And we will gear toward, like I said, the career development and career exposure for this age group. And the age group, just to be specific, is really four to eight for our purposes. And it's really to get kids ready and thinking about things that they, you know, careers, et cetera, that they just might not be exposed to in their normal course of uh, family interaction, et cetera. And, um, and of course, you know, PBS and CBB and the Department of Ed are all really eager to think about not only how we can have, uh, have this type of content available for um, kids, but also like, what are the ideas that we, we haven't thought of? And so that's the other idea is to look for new ideas, new teams, really freshen, freshen things up. And that's why we're opening it up to a, a lot of applications to be considered. It's not a standard RFP. Um, the other thing that I wanted to just leave it with before I pass it back to Stephanie is that if you, if you are selected to participate, you will really leave our training program really with a lot of skills that you need to make your podcast successful. And it, it's a foundational program where we focus on the listener needs, creating points of view um, of your listener and really shaping and understanding the technology, marketing, et cetera, that's all involved. It's really a soup to nuts program. Um, so Stephanie, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, Carrie. Um, next slide, please, Eric. This is an animated slide. So, but there are plenty of benefits and perks to being selected to participate in this accelerator as Carrie just alluded to. Um, you know, the skills that you need, the mindsets that you'll need, the processes and habits that you'll form. Uh, but here are some top line things that the five teams will receive. So like Carrie said, 16 weeks of rigorous virtual training. Um, Next, click again. Uh, you'll get tons of mentorship and feedback. We will there. Um, we build in a weekly check-in kind of system where you will be getting tons of guidance around best practices. You'll have a project manager who will help you give you feedback, as well as help you through like tons of your creative like roadblocks. You know, so there's tons of that. Um, you'll have a community of other podcasters that are learning just alongside you, and you will learn with them. Um, next, Eric. Um, you will also get $10,000 as a stipend to offset production costs throughout training. And then Carrie can handle these last two benefits. Yeah, um, one of the things that is, is important in uh, digital uh, media is really having a good understanding about how the distribution works. It's very different than uh, radio and broadcast. And so we make sure that explaining the technology is all part of our training, but also um, all of the participants in the program will also be on PRX's platform. And we have a full published platform. We make our own ad technology. And the, the thing that I want to make sure that you understand about what differentiates our technology from others is that we care a lot about user privacy, which of course is so essential in kids' content. And so that is one of the other uh, support systems that come along with this, with this training. And um, I think this will attract many of you, which is that one of the shows will be picked up by PBS Kids for uh, for further development. And that could mean lots of different things. And so we're really excited about that opportunity and the partnership with PBS on that front. If you wanna know some more details about that, it is available in the FAQ. Great, next slide, please. So we're just gonna run through a couple of very common questions, kind of the big core questions that are on the FAQ um, and give an opportunity to provide some more context and some more nuance. So can I submit an existing podcast? 
Sure, absolutely. Either existing podcasts or new ideas that aren't in production are perfectly fine to submit. Our main criteria really is that all teams be flexible about their ideas and be open to feedback, changing and pivoting. During our training program, you really go through some like eye-opening experiences and tons of teams in the past uh, during our past accelerators have really kind of taken new directions because they were open to it. So um, we, we often say like, don't be too precious with whatever idea that you submit because we will help you rethink it. What kind of podcast are we looking for? So um, we've alluded to this a little bit before, but we are specifically looking for new or existing podcast ideas that aim to introduce children ages four to eight and their families with an emphasis on low-income families to the world of work and future careers. Um, this includes content that illustrates important social skills and dispositions like self-confidence, goal-oriented behavior, task persistence, as well as exposure to a variety of jobs and careers. We are open to podcasts of all formats and subject matters. So you could be a fiction show, a nonfiction show. It could really target all types of different careers or different characters, different storylines. Um, but all submissions must strive to promote intergenerational learning and prioritize educational experiences over one solely for entertainment. Um, beyond this, um, we ultimately really want to work with podcasts and teams that have vision and want to make something meaningful for their intended audience. Um, they're really, um, if we want to move to the next slide, Eric, um, this kind of leads into like what an, an effective pitch is and there really isn't um, a, like a secret formula. So next slide, Eric, it's going to be another one of those bulleted. <laughs> so. Stephanie, while, the, while we're waiting for the slide, I'll just add that um, I think the most common question we get when we do these open uh, call for submissions is uh, what idea are you looking for? And it's the question that we really resist answering because as Stephanie just said, we're really interested in fresh ideas. We also are interested in ideas that may shift over the course of the training. So openness and uh, responsiveness to feedback is also one of the kind of characteristics that we're, we're looking for, for people to work with. Absolutely. I think we often say too that we're not just investing in ideas, we're investing in people and in teams. And so really it's just like kind of an amalgamation of a ton of qualities and when we know, we know. But um, just to provide some, a slide for you all for reference, there is no secret formula for the most compelling pitch, but we've read so many applications in the past that we kind of know one in our gut when we see one. But a good pitch really cap that captures our attention really tends to have all these following qualities. So um, those pitches are specific and meaningful. We really like details and we want you to go um, we want you to go past ideas that are just broad concepts. So can you provide like character names? Can you provide story arcs? All that kind of stuff. Um, has a clear idea of its intended audience. We know that the show will be for children ages 48, and there really is kind of a dedicated mission about exposure to careers. But I think it's it's a really good um, opportunity for you to envision who those children are. What are their names? What do they like to do? What will they get out of your show? Can you create this personable audience profile? So um, I believe if we are asking- What do they need? And what do they what need? That audience? Yes. And so when we ask you who your intended audience is, saying children ages four to eight is not going to cut it, even though we do know that is our intended audience. But we really want to know, um, can you imagine who that end user actually is going to be since every show is different? Um, it offers broader context that puts the podcast into time and place. So what's going on in the world culturally, socially, technologically that really justifies your specific idea? Being able to like put your podcast in time and space really and provide that text is um, really vital actually when pitching a show and making something meaningful and timely. Next bullet point, please. Um, it sets itself, this is pretty much speaks for itself. It sets itself apart in the current landscape of existing children's content. So really make a case for like, you know, why your show is needed in this or, you know, or what kind of, or what it's building off of. Next one, it provides details about specific episodes, what listeners can expect to hear and experience. Again, details, we really like details. 
And finally, and I think this is actually one of the most important ones, it demonstrates why you are the team with the skills, the vision, the drive to make this show. Um, again, we, we invest not only in ideas, but in people and in teams. And you really want to know, like, why you? Why now? Um, why couldn't this show be made by any other person out in the world? Um, all right, so I've already seen this question pop up in the QA. So what kind of teams should participate? We are looking for passionate creative production teams in the United States. So you have to be based in the US because this is a grant by the US Department of Education um, with a ton, of, a ton of qualities that are listed in the FAQ, but top line um, teams with a demonstrated level of experience or interest in children's storytelling and educational media, um, some demonstrated level of, of experience in audio production and editing, and, you know, just broadly a passion and empathy for children and wanting to help children in their life and help them succeed. Um, we've said this before, a willingness and capacity to undertake a 16-week training, um, an openness to learning and adopting new processes, taking feedback and make pivots if necessary. So flexible, passionate, empathetic teams with some audio experience and experience in children's um, uh, media and content creation. Um, as long as you meet that criteria or you feel that you meet that criteria, we are really open to both independent production teams and teams affiliated with organizations or media organizations. So public media stations, newspapers, that kind of stuff. Next slide. Carrie, I believe this is yours. Yeah, um, I just I think that one of the things that we do get questions about is um, can you do this with absolutely no experience at all? And we prefer production teams with some experience in this field, but we also we we don't want to cut off great ideas, or we don't want to, and we also want to make sure that we are open to. Uh, really close in adjacent space, like maybe you, maybe you do a show for a slightly older group or something like that. So we, you you don't have to have um, you don't have to have exact direct experience, but we we want you to be very detailed in your perspective and why your team is the right team as as Stephanie has um, laid out. And I also want to make sure that. We're, we are really interested in new talent and new ideas. And so that does mean that we are, um, we'll teach you all the things that you need to know along the way. Basic audio uh, production and editing is not part of this training. We do, and that doesn't mean that um, we don't see lots of easy transition uh, folks that come from video editing. So that, that so totally is fine, but like basic, like how do I hold a microphone, all that kind of stuff, that's really not part of, of this training. But we are looking for new, fresh ideas, new, fresh teams that we haven't met before. And um, so we're really opening it up pretty wide. Go ahead, Eric. And I think, Carrie, you just answered this. Um, what about audio experience? Um, yes, you need to have, um, experience producing audio um, because the training will focus so much more on idea and audience development and uh, community engagement and specifically developing children's programming and curriculum. Um, you do not have to be a seasoned sound engineer. You don't have to have several years of sound mixing or anything in your, in, in your belt, but um, we will not cover basic audio production or basics. Um, you have to be able to know how to handle an audio recorder and a mic and know basic software and all that kind of stuff. Um, we will do, we will spend some time like really developing sound and developing like the tone and like the sound quality, but um, anything before that, that's not our priority. All right, next slide, the 16 week training. So um, hopefully I can answer some of the questions in the FA and coming into the Q&A in this section. But so it is a 16 week virtual training. The first 12 weeks are dedicated to hands-on training from trainers at PRX and mentorship with staff. Um, we kick things off with a one week intensive quote boot camp. Um, in May, where we will cover fundamental skills, tools, and mindsets that will really set you up for the rest of the program, really kind of 
design thinking principles. We we um, we frame all of our training around design thinking, or you may have heard of it as audience first or human centered design. Then after that one week boot camp for the remaining 11 weeks, you will participate in weekly synchronous group sessions, which will integrate lecture, design thinking activities and processes, peer to peer learning, guest speakers um, once a week. So these are synchronous sessions you're required to attend as a group in a virtual room once a week. And that session lasts about five hours. Um, there will also be some off weeks so that you can actually get a break, get some work done, um, and you know, meet with your advisor and all that and whatnot. But for the most part, you have to, there is always going to be like something happening each week. Um, we also schedule mandatory bi-weekly mentorship check-ins and also webinars. Um, they're optional in the sense that you don't have to attend them, but we do require that everybody at least watches the video. Um, these are all things that will supplement your learning throughout the training. You can expect approximately five to 10 hours of work for any given week. Um, that includes your synchronous group sessions, webinars, and independent work on assignments. So I think some of you asked, like, does this have to be a full-time thing? Definitely not. Um, you just have to be able to make sure that you are able to complete the assignments and attend all the sessions. Um, the final four weeks, um, so that's 12 weeks, the final four weeks are reserved for the teams to work on and submit their final deliverables. Um, so there won't be any like group sessions or webinars during that time. That is really just four weeks for you to take everything you learned and provide all the kind of final package for us. Then there will be a final showcase after that 16 weeks, which will involve some prep and rehearsals as well. Um, attendance is to these uh, group sessions, participation, active participation is mandatory. And of course, we do our best to set a program schedule and cadence that accommodates all of our participants' schedules. But we do ask that you please offer your greatest flexibility to maximize the chance that we can include you and that you can get the most out of it as well. So just again, five to 10 hours a week for 16 weeks. Stephanie, you're reminding me you're highlighting one of the things that we really hope is a value a value all the way through. So we hope that like by organizing your application that in and of itself is a good strong value that some of our prompts will get you to think. And then also, um, you know, one of the things we've seen over so many trainings is the importance of that cohort. So it's not it, like you said, it's a very reasonable amount of time, but the, the watching each other kind of progress through the training is really helpful. It really expands your professional network to um, and support network for because podcasting is a lonely business. So this really helps that. Yeah, something that we've noticed about all of our training programs is that um, you really, really learn more about your show than you than you did coming into it and you really learn to like understand and talk about and like iterate um like actually express what your show is about in a more succinct effective and compelling way and that alone being able to fill out an application with the prompts that we provided um participating in pitch panels throughout the training really helps you better understand your show especially if you're someone who learns by like doing and saying um there are for, if you want to go to the next slide, Eric, and just go ahead and click through the bullet points. Um, there are four key deliverables, um, your final deliverables. These are the four things that we will require um, to complete our 16 week program. You will complete one pilot episode. This is not going to be the final polished product because we know things are always changing, but you will have basically built out an episode. Um, you will have a production and editorial calendar for your upcoming season, a preliminary promotion and communicate, uh, community engagement strategy, and a 10 minute final showcase presentation that we talked about. Um, we know though that you know over the course of four weeks and several months before you launch that a lot of things can change throughout the production process. So we really don't expect that you commit entirely to everything that you submit but your deliverables and everything that you do in this program should be bringing you closer to a final product or at the very least provide a very strong and clear foundation for the remaining trajectory of your work. So these final deliverables we know are changed, they're ever evolving, 
but we want to at least know that you've made the effort to get this started and move forward on it and move forward with your show. This is a big question. <laughs> we get this question a lot. Um, uh, and the, the answer is, is simple. Uh, PRX does not take any intellectual property in any show that's part of our uh, training, even, even as I described in the beginning that we do offer our technology and our distribution services, we still do not take any uh, intellectual uh, property. We do, each team will sign a contract because we do, uh, we, you know, this is funded, as I mentioned, through the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And so we have uh, deliverables and grant obligations that we kind of expect with each team. And we wanna make sure that we have a, a document that clarifies exactly what's expected over this time. But there's no intellectual property that, that we are um, making any claim to. Um, the, there will, however, be um, a separate agreement for the one team that has a separate relationship with PBS Kids. And that we also may um, wanna make sure that there's a rights understanding for things get posted on PBS Kids website, et cetera. So there are some additional documents that will be put in place for that extended promotion. Um, but really as PBS thinks about what, the, what that further investment could be, whether it's a subsequent season or whether it's uh, other platforms, et cetera, that will be governed by a totally separate agreement with PBS. That's not, an, that's not a, um, a need for the training in and of itself. And, um, and that the rights that they look for um, are likely to be exclusive, even if there's no IP sharing. So, but that'll be a separate agreement that uh, PBS will manage. We'll probably get some other questions on this. It's I know that IP is a, a sticky issue for um, to understand, but but simply put, you do not need to uh, think about your IP to participate in the training. Can I apply to Ready to Learn if I've already participated in a PRX accelerator? Yes, you can. However, you must apply with a new idea for a children's podcast that fits the mission and the goals we stated. Um, we also recommend if you have done a PRX accelerator that you send different team members so that you're kind of spreading skills and tools throughout your organization or throughout your production team. Um, so for example, if you participated in a previous accelerator, whether that's Project Catapult or the Google Podcast Creator Program with the Kids Podcast, um, you cannot apply for Ready to Learn with that same show. All right, next one. And can I get feedback on my application? Unfortunately, no. Uh, we get tons of applications for our accelerators and we don't have the capacity to respond to every question or every request for feedback. Um, so unfortunately, I think the best advice I have for you is um, wait and see who the selected teams are and do some research about them and maybe try to suss out yourself like what perhaps um, they had that, you know, what made their podcast stand out versus my own. Um, yes. We try hard to be very comprehensive in the FAQ and also, uh, it, I think it's one of the, you laid it out really well, Stephanie, on sort of like, this is what, this is what you really need to be thinking about. Yeah. And again, I think a lot of people, um, are hesitant to apply and you want to know that you are eligible in all of these ways, I say like really the eligibility for this is that you want to make a children's podcast for children's ages four to eight, um, focused on career readiness and that you're based in the US. And really after that, there's no harm in applying. And even if you aren't selected, like we said, the application process is going to be really helpful for you as you do develop your show anyway. So um, don't, uh, don't hold back on the opportunity. There really is no harm in applying. Um, so Eric, next slide, please. Um, again, like we said, there will be, we're gonna answer questions for the, the rest of this webinar, um, but a reminder that we do have another information webinar on March 3rd at 3 p.m. Eastern. You can mark your calendars. You can also register for that at the Ready to Learn website. Um, we will go over all these same questions and maybe, and we will also add some more that we're seeing pop up. Um, so feel free to join that one as well. That's a, that's a good reminder that our FAQ will 
kind of evolve over time between now and the deadline. So definitely come back and look because we'll add new questions that we get to that FAQ. All right, and then the next slide, Eric, another reminder of the deadline in case you forgot it, March 19th at 5 p.m. Eastern. That is the deadline for the application. Um, anything submitted past that will not be considered. All right, so now we're gonna open up to questions. Eric, we can uh, stop sharing if that would make things a little bit easier. Yep. Um, we have tons of questions in the Q&A that Eric will kind of um, bring to our attention. Um, and if there is anything that we don't get to, we will add to the FAQ um, or address at a later time, at, at a later webinar. So Eric, what are Great. our questions? All right, Steph. So uh, a lot of questions we got were related to number of people on your team. So is it okay for there to be one person teams and what's the max number of people per team? Yeah, so the max number of people is three. And that's mainly because we want to create um, a very flexible learning, virtual learning environment and past like 20 something people starts to get difficult. So the max number is three. Um, you can definitely be a solo producer, but we, we recommend um, that you do have somebody um, to help you through this process because podcasting is really difficult and having a team member to share in the creative struggles, but also in the assignments and the work can be really helpful, but it can be a single person team. Um, the makeup of this team, if there's more than one person, we often recommend that it's like a host and a producer, a host and a sound engineer. Um, and if you wanna bring three people that that third person be involved with like social media or promotion strategies, that kind of stuff. Um, honestly, the more inter, inter and multidisciplinary your team is, the more you're going to get out of this because um, the more perspectives there are in the room, the more ideas you'll get. Not everybody has to be a, a, either right in front of the mic or doing the editing. That's, I think, a good reminder, Stephanie. Yeah. And um, if your team, if you do work at an organization where there is like a larger production team involved, pick the three people you think will best represent the work. Um, and then you're, we highly recommend that you take those lessons learned. We share resources with all of our participants and take those back to your greater organization. Thank you. So the next question uh, is related to the theme and topic. Uh, could it be about STEM and then have uh, different episodes about different aspects, aspects of STEM? So like how broad, how narrow the topic for the podcast? Um, Carrie, do you want to answer that or? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, I think the answer to that is yes. I think that, um, as long as, uh, you can help us make sense of that connection, then definitely add those, that level of detail in your, um, application for sure. Yeah. Like I said, the, um, requirements are pretty broad right now. And so the application is your chance to make a really strong case for why your specific theme or genre or topic is going to fit into that mission. Awesome. So next question, oh, we got, uh, I think, two or three of these. Uh, what if the age range of your audience falls slightly above or below or, you know, overlaps by a bit? Um, what happens then? Um, I guess Stephanie, I'll take this one, but uh, the core the core that we're looking for is this four to eight, but that's a that is definitely a fuzzy, fuzzy line, but it really has to hit that core. It's okay if it goes a little older and it's okay if it goes a little bit younger, but we don't want to like slide the whole thing, I guess I would say. So we're not looking for like seven to ten. Like it's really in the four to eight window. but but we expect there to be concentric circles outside of that uh, who might enjoy the show. Yeah, like children and uh, ch children is a very different group than preteens. So we want to make sure that we're not kind of sliding into a whole new age demographic. Awesome. So this question is about the type of training. Uh, or uh, So what kind of software will be used during the training? What, um, so related to software tools, etc. Whatever you have. Um, this, uh, we aren't you know, this is your production team. This is how you prefer to do things in your own home and in your own your own company or organization. So um, there's no requirement for what kind of software. If you prefer Hindenburg, if you prefer Audition or Pro Tools, it's whatever you want, what's most comfortable for you. 
we are really actually just helping you build processes so that you can take them back home and like make them work for yourself. So um, no requirements. We just do ask that whatever software you do use that you actually are comfortable using it and that it's, and that you know how to use it. Yeah. Our team is very fluid across all these products. Um, but in terms of software, like in applications that we use throughout the training, we will be using Zoom um, for all of our synchronous sessions and our webinars. We often set up calendar invites through Google Calendar um, to kind of help keep you organized and keep your schedule together. We use a virtual whiteboard program called Miro, M-I-R-O, as a way to like facilitate brainstorms and activities. Um, but for the most part, pretty standard virtual softwares that we use for the training. So as long as you have an internet connection and clearly you're here so you can use Zoom, um, that's all you really need. Oh, we also use Slack too as a way to do very quick, um, urgent communication. Cool. Uh, so uh, clarification questions on the structure of the training. Is a boot camp uh, in person or online? And is it a 40 hour week? No, it's, it's, so it's virtual. Um, we wish it was in person. These used to be in person, but it is virtual um, until, until there's no longer a pandemic. And no, the boot camp is five days and about five hours a day. So it's about 25 hours, not a full 40 hour a week. So if you do have a full-time job outside of the podcast production, that is something that you will have to work out with your employer. And the subsequent ones, uh, Stephanie, those are much easier to fit in because they're yeah. they're short. They're once a week. Yeah, they're once a week and they run from four to five hours. And again, we haven't really set the exact time and day of the week yet because we want to kind of collect that availability from our accepted participants. But generally speaking, after the boot camp, it's one day a week for about four to five hours. Um, with some additional webinars scattered throughout that you can either attend synchronously or watch on your own time. And again, about five to 10 hours of work a week. If you work much faster, less than that, if you require more time, more than that. Great. So this next, next question is about the two minute audio uh, for the application. Can you tell us more about it? Yeah, so it's, we wanna hear, um, we want to get a set an early sense of what you're going for, what your vision is here. So um, our only requirement is that it has to be two minutes or under. It can't be more. We don't have the time or capacity as a selection committee to listen to full episodes. So do not drop your full episodes in there unless they happen to only be two minutes. Um, this is um, it could uh, the two minute clip could be from an existing episode that you've already produced if you're an existing podcaster. Um, or had the shows already in production, it could be something aspirational. So if you're only in the idea phase and you haven't really done anything with the audio yet, um, really encourage you to get creative here and create something aspirational. It's not gonna be an audio sample that gets distributed publicly, it's totally internal. So go ahead and plug in music, um, clips from YouTube that, um, that kind of speak to that tone that you're going for. Prototype something. Cool. Thank you. So the next one is you mentioned uh, that teams need to be based in the US. If one team member is temporarily living outside the US, uh, is, it, is this grounds for a disqualification? But how, yeah, so what's the US requirement? Carrie, I'll let you take that one. Yeah, no, I, I mean, people are temporarily uh, spread all over the place. So no, uh, just know that this is um, the, the uh, final product is intended for a U.S. audience at this at this time. Now, podcasts op obviously are um, digital; they go everywhere, but we are looking for um, a U.S. U.S. based team. But it doesn't matter if there's a temporary relocation during the pandemic. Cool. Thank you, Carrie. So this next one uh, is about uh, IP. Creators will own their IP. PBS Kids will ask for an ex exclusive distribution license. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, so Sarah's uh, clarifying, but um, there, there were a lot of questions about IP, so I'll just read that. Um, so creators will create their own IP. PBS Kids will ask for an exclusive distribution license for the podcast idea that goes to production. Um, so Carrie, if you wanted to add anything on no, that. No, that's, that's great. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> cool. I'll put that in the chat too, so people don't. So feel free to look at the chat. I'll type that in there. Great, thank you, Sarah. 
just trying to make sure that I get covered because there's a lot of uh, repeat questions. Um, uh, right, so here's a question about involvement from multi the multi-generational involvement. Uh, do you want the content to be specifically um, message, message to our parents or kids? Um, what, what is the multi-generational aspect and how important is it? Uh, yeah, and again, um, I think that if if there we can um, we have a group group activity here with uh, PBS and CBB who can add anything. But um, but what we do know is that kids in this age group are um, more likely to be doing communal listening, and so the it it the the four to eight year olds are really the core audience. But we also are looking for some creativity around things that can be enjoyed by their caregivers, et cetera. Um, and so it's, it's anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there and see if anyone from uh, CBB or PBS wants to elaborate. Cool. I think uh, that's straightforward. I think awesome. well, through the training, we will also um, be learning a lot about how parents and children or guardians and children um, in like, interact together while listening like that's like the intergenerational aspect of it so we are developing in our training kind of how we test for that and how we um develop with that in mind so um but sarah um if you want to type into the q a with an answer we can go ahead and share that as well and um and tied to the theme of kind of exposure to careers etc so that you can really be creative with weaving in that intergenerational and careers etc Cool. Uh, this next question is about, again, the, the team makeup. Uh, should every team member plan to attend every session or is it okay for one person from the team to represent for one session and then switch, switch around? Um, definitely, uh, we understand that like life happens and people can't always make things. Um, we do suggest, we do recommend, highly encourage that at least one person is consistently coming every week. Um, it can be really difficult to sync up a team if different people are attending different sessions. So one person should act as kind of the like, like the primary representative of the podcast and that person should clear their schedules to attend. But of course we understand and we work, we're very, our team is super flexible and we're very, um, we, we want to make everyone comfortable. So um, once you're selected and we are going through the processes and you can communicate with us what's going on, we'll work with you. But definitely one person should strive to attend every session. And that person should be able to communicate lessons learned to the team members that can't make it. Cool. A clarification question here on the application. Um, if, if, you, if I already applied to the PRX Accelerator with the Kids Podcast, can I use that same idea for this accelerator? Um, well, you can if you weren't selected for the, right, is that right, Stephanie? Yeah, so you can if you weren't selected. If you've already participated in an, in an accelerator with a kid's podcast, you cannot apply again with the same podcast. But if you applied and you weren't selected, you can apply with that, with that show. We've got several questions about multi-language podcasts. Um, so one person asks if it's okay for 80% to be in English, 20% in Spanish, and other wants to mix English, Spanish, and German. So well, what are the possibilities there? This, this question we've gotten by email too. And I think that we, um, we need to huddle about this one. So this one will, will definitely show up in the FAQ because we're getting it enough. And I'm, I'm so excited about that, but we'll, we're getting it enough that we'll add it to the FAQ. I think we should, we wanna make sure that we're comprehensive in our answer. Cool. Uh, this next question is, can a production company submit two ideas with two different teams? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> um, that's that's hard. I mean, we have said that um, in the past. We if you are a, a team that has multiple ideas and you're wanting to kind of like up your chances, we say don't do that and have one idea that's your strongest idea. I mean, in all honesty, like we can't stop you from submitting more than one. Uh, but we do recommend that, like, if your strategy is let's just set, submit a ton and hope one of them makes it through. Um, not 
going to be your best strategy. I think huddle together as an organization and pick kind of the strongest one that meets all of the criteria and the, um, the mission and the goals that we've outlined already. Uh, Eric, I saw a question here about uh, more about the expectations of being picked by PBS, um, but I, I think that that uh, it was a, was partially answered by Sarah that uh, you know, PBS kids will uh, look for future investments, and that could be an additional podcast season. It could be uh, another platform, whether a game or a short video or a tell. I mean, it could it could really it could be a, go in a lot of different directions. And there are very few, we're very excited that audio is playing a big role in thinking about multi-platform content. And so we don't, we don't know prescriptively how that will uh, go. I think PBS is like really excited and really open to the possibilities, but it'll definitely be some future investment. Thank you, um, just looking through Thanks for all the questions, great questions. Um, let me see. Uh, so there's a question in here about the length, of, like in the application, how long the question should be. Uh, I, we have paragraph form, uh, long form answers, but uh, what are we expecting in terms of length? Um, I mean, I say don't write us a novel, <laughs> but definitely be offer like a lot of good details. Some of the best applications we've gotten are ones that took some time to like tell us more about their audience, about ideas, about what their episodes are about, what their future plans are about, um, what they hope to learn, that kind of stuff. So there isn't a limit to how much you could type in. We haven't set them. Uh, please be cognizant that like if the if you're sending in tons and tons and tons and tons of words that we probably won't be able to read everything. Um, the only, I think the only question that we want you to be as succinct as possible is your elevator pitch. So keep it to one to three sentences. Like that is the, that's kind of the, um, like what's gonna capture my attention quickly. And then you can take time in your extended pitch to really build out like characters, story arcs, context, that kind of stuff. Cool. Um, thank you. So the next question is uh, so a clarification on dates. Uh, so are the dates for the boot camp set and when uh, does the 16 week begin? Yeah. So um, yes, they have been set. Um, currently I have the calendar. I'm, I don't want to, this is, I want to be careful here because there's always, things are always shifting. Um, but right now it's set for the last week of May for, for boot camp. Um, that might, we might be moving things around depending on, you know, how the selection process goes or if, you know, anything happens in the world. Uh, but right now the goal is the, the very end of May and that will be when the 16 week starts and that will be that first week of boot camp. Uh, back to the um, base, US based um... Uh, criteria, when you say it's U.S. based, do you mean U.S. citizen also? Um, that's a fair question, and I think we're going to have to follow up on that. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know. We'll find out. Cool, thank you. I'm um, trying to, uh, let me see. I'm so excited that we get global questions about language yeah. education. That's a, that's a good sign. Cool. Uh, and then uh, again, a lot of uh, clarification. Um, so here's a question about audience. Are you open to niche audiences within the four to eight age group? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, podcasting is niche media. So yeah, definitely. Cool. Uh, next question is, when do you expect to notify selected teams? End of April. By, by or before April 30th is our goal. So that will give each of the teams plenty of time to um, sit in the excitement of being selected and also prepare mentally and logistically for the training at the end of May. Uh, awesome. Stephanie, I, I saw one here that is for you, which is, um, should the sample audio be 
for like if you have an existing show that might be for a slightly older audience that you plan on um, retrofitting for the younger audience, should you use the existing example or should you make something new? I don't know if you have an answer to that. Um, I would say make something new. Because if you have an older audience, like that, aud that audio will not be, a, I mean, won't be appropriate for someone ages four to eight. So this is again, the chance to prototype something and, and think aspirationally. Awesome. Uh, here's another question. Um, does this show have to be explicitly about careers or can it be more implicitly about the tools kids need to uncover their passions or career interests? It's a good question. <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, I, uh, my internet got a little bit unstable there, but I think the question was, uh, you know, how, how much on target does the does the um, show have to be, or can it be kind of in the an, an adjacent space of career development, kind of like the STEM question? And I, I think that um, balancing this tension between the details that Stephanie is asking for, which is like make sure we know exactly what you're, how you, how you plan to hit that target, and also like not not um, being too narrow in our interpretation. That's a that's a good tension to have. It's a good creative tension for you to like. Uh, think about your application, and I, so I think it's all it's all in that zone that's acceptable for us. Yeah. Um, Stephanie, I had another uh, question that I thought I thought of uh, that I don't know the answer to. Um, I'm not. Don't worry, I'm not applying. Um, but I had a question about uh, whether whether the two minute audio excerpts will be judged on. Um, uh, like post production and and audio engineering, or is it really really conceptual, really prototype? Like, and if you could just give people a little sense of that, a little bit of both, because we do are because we are requiring technical experience, um, audio production experience. We are going to be listening for like some like a dexterity and like you know ability to do to work with audio, but really the the audio samples a sense for us to like abstractly understand like get a sense of what you're going for. Um, it's really it's one thing to read a pitch. It's one thing to completely like hear a vision for a pitch. So um, keep that in mind. Like it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, certainly if you are a new idea and you don't have audio already prepared. Um, it doesn't have to be like perfectly mixed or like ready to drop tomorrow. Um, but we will be listening for some, um, you know, for some skill level, uh, but mostly for us to have a sense of like what your, what your vision is, what you're, what you're going for. And we, we, we fully expect, because this happens, I think, in every training we run, which is that you also won't be held to that initial two minute um, audio because we we actually hope that ideas evolve and change and pivot over the course of the training. Cool. So uh, another question is, uh, this is a broad question, how many episodes are in the season we're creating? And I it interpreted as both, um, you know, what, what's the requirement for the, as part of the training program? And then uh, after that, what, what what is the requirement in terms of episodes that should be produced in the season? Um, Stephanie, do you want me to answer this or do you want? Can you just repeat the first half, first part of that question, Eric? Yeah, so how, again, the, the question is how many episodes are in the, se in the season we're creating? So uh, what is the requirement during the, the, the program and what's the requirement after the program? Um, I can answer like conceptually and then Carrie can maybe add on to that. I'll just say like there is no I mean, the number of episodes that make the most sense for your show will make the most sense to your audience. And you won't really, we won't really know that for sure until we've spent some time developing your idea in the program. Um, but there are some there, I mean, there is a general understanding in the industry of like what's best. So Carrie, if you wanna take that question on. Yeah, and the requirement for the training is, as Stephanie said earlier, you know, it's really a pilot. That's kind of the output that we're we're hoping for. But as you map out what your season is, the, the most common thing in podcasting is a uh, uh, twelve uh, months and contain twenty four episodes. And many many shows make that every other week production schedule, and many do three 
um, three seasons of eight episodes. There's lots of ways to, to do that. For our purposes, for our training, we're, you know, you can, as Stephanie said, you know, let the, let the content be the guide on what, what is needed. We are looking for shows that do have uh, something beyond the pilot and something beyond one single season. We are looking for, for ideas that have some longevity. And that speaks to uh, the, the PBS kids' interest in further development too. So we're, we're looking for things that have a, a longer vision, um, not, not a special mini series that has a, a stop and start within a very short amount of time. That's really, you know, media, it, for adults and kids, especially podcasts are all habit. So we're looking for, there was another question about like, can it be beyond 10 episodes? Absolutely. You can, you can tell us whatever your, what, whatever your thinking is on your show. So we have several questions about the sample audio. Uh, does the sample audio have to be uh, for our new idea or can it be uh, existing shows we have done? Yeah, again, if you are an existing children's podcast um, that fits the criteria, um, you can apply with old, um, existing audio. Um, you can also go ahead and prototype something new or different. Um, it just has to be two minutes or less. Cool, thank you. Um, I think another part of the question is like, if, if you already um, have a show and you wanna create a new one, can you use the old one as a demo? Um, don't recommend it. Um, I really think that, you know, we're trying to develop the idea that you're applying with. Um, so it's going to be much better for you to start prototyping kind of your aspiration and your vision for a new idea, um, early. So definitely if you, if you're applying with a new show, don't send audio from a different show, send us like prototype something aspirational. And Stephanie, is it okay if like, say you're doing a, your two minute audio involves a lot of children's voices, is it okay for the prototype purposes to use adult voices for that, that you know will be swapped out? Like those kinds of things. Um, yeah, I don't actually, I don't, I don't mind that at all. There is going to be a, there's a section in the application that tells you to describe what we're hearing in the audio to be able to make up for that nuance. But um, something that we have done in the past with through our training program is like creating um, we call them mood boards, like sound mood boards. And so if you don't have like, you know, your cast of characters lined up, if you feel uncomfortable acting out, you know, children's voices, um, you can, you can actually just go ahead and kind of create a sound mood board where you're collecting sounds from TV shows or existing podcasts or, or combining it with other things to create a sense of the show in that way too. We're really being brought, I'm really allowing you all to interpret like what that two minute audio sample is broadly. Um, really our only criteria is that it is it pertains to the show that you're applying with and that it is under two minutes. So you can go ahead and submit a two minute sample, like an actual two minute clip of an existing show. You could submit a trailer. Um, you could go ahead and do, be completely experimental and send me a sound mood board where you're like, you know, if you're going to make a show about teaching children about coral and the sea, if you want to make a sound mood board with like clips from SpongeBob or clips from like other, like go for it. I'm fine with that. Cool. Just sort of explain what you're doing in your application. Otherwise I might be confused. <laughs> I saw two here, Eric. One is like, can you have partners that you apply for? Absolutely. We, 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 we see that all the time and, and don't mind that at all. And that's related to the other one that I see here, Eric, which is um, somebody wasn't able to hear the size of the team. And so um, uh, we do cap it at three to keep the kind of cohort cohesive, but they can be, they don't have to be three people with the, it's not three hosts, it's not always like a producer and a host. You can also think of people who might be responsible for marketing in that in that trio but no more than three great we see lots of teams of one too yes teams of one um we've we've had tons of teams of one and they um they eventually go on to a higher producer so 
but, <laughs> but you can definitely be a team of one in the tra- for training purposes. Um, I think with our final minute, I think I just want to, I think just to kind of this last bit of advice that will kind of encompass the rest of the questions is that um, don't hold yourself back from applying because you think you might not meet one specific eligibility criteria. Again, um, even if you, even if ultimately our committee decides that you aren't eligible or whatnot, the application itself is going to help you develop your idea so that you can make actionable steps forward um, with your show on your own. So I see a lot of questions about like, is it okay if we also have a video? Like, are we qual- are we eligible if this and that and that? Like, just apply. Um, it, we will decide if you know. We will decide if it's eligible or not. We. We are very well-rounded in our selection criteria. So we're not gonna say something like, oh, because of X, this person is disqualified. Like we're not that kind of a selection committee. Um, And so there is, I just wanna encourage you all, if there's that little question and you're a little bit worried that it's gonna disqualify you, just apply and let us decide that. Mm -hmm. And um, even if it does, even if you aren't selected for this program because we are only taking five teams, um, let this application be a really helpful tool for you in the future as well. So, um, yeah, and if you want to fill out the application, just submit it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll add to that, that there are some questions in here that we'll need to follow up with, and uh, in particular, the langu- language one and some of the uh, geography ones. And so this, uh, as as we said earlier, the FAQ will be evolving and we'll take the, if you were here and and we didn't get to your question, we will be um, adding to the FAQ for anything that might be missing. Great. Um, Thank you all so much. Um, Really appreciate you all coming out. Um, Have a great weekend. Again, a reminder that our next webinar will be March 3rd. You can register for that at our website that's on the screen right here. And we will hopefully have um, updates to some of those questions either in the FAQ and definitely we'll bring those up in the next webinar when it comes up. So um, really looking forward to seeing your applications. And again, don't let, don't let yourself hold yourself back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Bye everyone. Have a good one.